And our speaker today is uh, Michael Jacobides. Uh, he's uh, flew over from London, uh, where he is the uh, Sir Donald Gordon Chair of Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the London Business School, uh, well-known uh, scholar in the area of strategy, longtime friend. And today he's going to be talking about towards the theory of ecosystems. Take it away, Mike. Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be here uh, speaking about uh, somewhat unusually a paper that is sort of more theory and uh, conceptual. And the reason that I wrote this is that I started getting both excited and concerned about the excitement of ecosystems. So let me start with the excitement about ecosystems. Uh, in uh, the biggest IPO uh, to date, Alibaba uh, had the word ecosystem no less than 164 times in its effect. And you know that both something good and something strange is happening when there is such excitement more than any other business firm, more than business model. Uh, more than synergies, more than all kinds of other stuff. And if you open up, say, Accenture, now Deloitte has a similar thing uh, in terms of ecosystems. I'm now working with Kinsey's group, which has a work group on ecosystems. Everyone wants to think about what ecosystems uh, uh, is. Yeah. Even more than platforms? Well, I think that uh, uh, so the word platforms appeared less in the uh, IPO deck, but I am not going to claim that this is universally more than platforms. It's bubbles and bubbles. So I'm claiming that this is a very large, but not the universally largest uh, bubble. So, uh, but you're going yeah, to explain what the difference is between a platform and an ecosystem. I will. And actually, the two are quite often used together. So, Andrew, uh, if you think about what people look at in terms of the ecosystem, usually they refer to successful firms that relate to platforms. And I'll try to go on in terms of the difference between the two. And whether there's something different and interesting in ecosystems, analytically speaking. Um, now, of course, when you see, say, the Deloitte uh, definitions, it's these uh, things that are generally feel nice and warm and fuzzy inside. Uh, and they kind of remind me of how the discussion we have with strategy is about dynamic capability, much more exciting than boring static capability. So in ecosystems, the world is happier. So ecosystems are dynamic and co-evolving communities, diverse actors who create and capture value, never destroy. Through collaboration and competition, generally good stuff happens, but when you start moving beyond the surface and then say, well, okay, how exactly does that differ from other forms of economic behavior, we do understand the general principles of all of that stuff, there isn't much. Now, Michael and Seedley and Levian's book, that was one of the books that uh, was uh, uh, quite, but one of the most cited books in the use of the term ecosystem, it's a book, uh, an advantage um, has an effort to define the ecosystem. And what you can say, and I just quote, drawing the precise boundaries of an ecosystem is an impossible and in any case, academic essence. Now, being a business school and strategy professor, I kind of bugs me. So the first thing is bring it on. And the second is, is there something in all this sort of super excitement about ecosystems that, that is distinct and that we can analyze and potentially use, or are there any particular features within an ecosystem that will help understand the different types of relationships that emerge uh, within that. That's just, you know, the growth, 14 and 15 were partial, counts the growth in terms of the uh, numbers of uh, published items uh, containing the term ecosystem, the title, abstract, or keywords in business outlets from SI Web of Science. Uh, but I guess that. Um, the interest of this paper is not just say what is an ecosystem, because over the last couple of years, people have sort of jumped in and then said, let me offer you my definition or my definition, and everyone offers the definition, which is great, because at least now we have actually a great number of potential definitions. But the question is, why should we care? And also, there is this comparative and crucial analysis that I have as I originally trained. So let me say what I have to think about ecosystem as a type of form, is an organizational form distinct from others that are just displacing market-based engagement or hierarchical governance, and you have to tell the story of how it differs, and when do you expect more of it to emerge, and if there is some underlying uh, factors uh, for that. So let me give you sort of the first introductory viewpoint in terms of where I stand with that, because you could say, well, why do you hear so much the word ecosystem? Go and uh, before you fly out in uh, one of these uh, places that sells business books, you will see the term ecosystem. 
Now, one of the reasons I think that you see that is that uh, we have seen a substantial change in the economy. So the rest of my work is on the evolution of industry architectures, the way and you know the way that actors change the rules of roles and engagement, changing the boundaries of the sectors, and changing forms of distribution of profits and accounts as a result. We have seen a fair amount of unbundling. There is deregulation and technology that has facilitated recombining things in new ways. And that essentially takes the existing traditional segregated boundary where we could safely define the sectors. And CSICs were a reflection of realities on the ground, where now things are much more iffy and you see greater configuration of play. The other thing that we see is that the EEDs are in the intersectional space, where the, you know, the, the things that happen between the cracks of the existing system. So ecosystems are essentially groups of actors that come from different areas that respond to some final patterns. So there are some underlying regulatory, technological, institutional changes that have created something that business violence is catching. On the other hand, uh, if you think about it from the theory side, if you look at the world, world of strategy, we have gone from the like base IO application our quarter that we had from the 70s until the 80s to a big excitement with sort of the evolutionary stuff, understanding the firms and their institutions and processes and their capabilities and dynamic capabilities and their trajectories. And now I think there is a return of interest in the aggregate, in the ecosystem systems, the finally aggregate of successful analysis, which can be really limiting in terms of strategy research. And I think people are getting excited for that. And finally, of course, uh, and also people uh, that are in business advising need new terms, and there is a bit of cynicism because the struggle for novelty is endogenously uh, explained by the structure of the profession as well. So we like hot stuff. Now, uh, I do think that ecosystems are here, but the question is why do they matter and when should we expect them to uh, arise? This paper is taking a theoretical standpoint and is going to try to provide a positive uh, theory or elements of a positive theory of something that could be distinct enough to make it interesting and work in a different way. Although I also recognize that the variety of terms and the evocative poetry of the word ecosystem could be useful in and of itself, and by a number of existing business authors, it has been used as poetry. And I'll be coming back uh, in a moment. So. Um, let me uh, delve stra uh, uh, straight in. Now, let's think about ecosystems. And if you go and look at the literature and then say, who, who has tried to define that stuff? People cite Moore. Moore's paper, which is an HBR, was part of the rather unusual idea that there are some S curve sort of processes uh, where things change and everything is interconnected. And we have to think about all these interconnections. Uh, and later papers like uh, or the books like Ian City and Levian said that it is everything and the kitchen sink. It is the companies to which you outsource, the institutions that provide you with financing, the firms that give you the technology, the makers of complementary products, the competitors, the customers, the regulators, the press, everyone. So I think that this sort of, to, to give a very crass characterization, is one of the uses of the term ecosystem, which is possibly useful as a rhetorical device to make managers aware of the broader environment and not only think of their immediate downstream area or of their upstream stuff. We did a little bit more on that in the previous version of the paper that's probably going to be refashioned because research policy was interested in it. Um, and I should say that this paper is uh, with uh, Annabel Gewehr and Carmelo Cenamo that I'm, I'm, uh, uh, that I'm presenting. Uh, and essentially by a combination of, um, we had an uh, AI conference so that's still uh, that's going on by a combination of endogenously playing with Envivo and seeing what the C classifiers uh, would be, as well as with a bit of the uh, our own views, uh, you could break them up into three categories. Uh, and the categories are ecosystems that look at the firm, that look at an innovation, or that look at the platform. So here we go to the question that you mentioned earlier on, Andrew: What is the relationship? There are some ecosystems that are rooted on platforms, on a multi sided platform, and they speak about independence and the status of the different players. But there are a number of other things where it is a 
platform could be you know, the mission of desire, or perhaps you know we can split hairs on whether it is or not a platform. And you know, if we keep thinking of a single-sided platform, or not. I think that the differences are in the literature, and again, this is not my view. I'm starting by describing the field before giving you my own views of how we can think about that stuff. So um, the ecosystem, uh, in terms of the firm, is considered as the firm's extended community. Uh, in terms of innovation, people try to figure out how a innovation that has interdependencies, usually along different parts of the production process, of the value chain, call it as you wish, interacts. And the third thing is a platform where we have an identifiable platform that connects a number of people on both sides. Yes? If I just pop up the new capital, do you think that might be a piece of the system? What am I doing wrong? Uh, so two things. If you're asking me uh, what do you get wrong from what people have looked at, um, you know, you are substituting the word elephant for orange. I mean, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not the same thing. Uh, what, the, what people are looking at an ecosystem, they need a set of players that are connected in some way. Capitalism <laughs> means. I mean. No, 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 no. Capitalism <laughs> is uh, at the boundary uh, is irrelevant. And I think that if you want to think about markets more generally, the question is whether there is a group of players that have clear interdependencies and that are bound together in some way. If you're asking me, is this analytically consistent, and are interdependencies part and parcel of the capitalist system, ask me clearly, please. But I'm just telling the literature. I ain't one of the kind of things that I didn't write. I'm just telling you what the flavor is. The problem that I see, and where I think you and I will agree with electricity, is that the definition of ecosystem on the basis of interdependence does not make much analytical sense and also features that sort of focuses on an outcome. Do some ecosystems work and some ecosystems also don't work? And I'll go to that in a moment. So let's hold the horses on this one. Um, so there's a lot of variants in the definitions that have been used in the literature. Now you can ask yourself, does this matter? Perhaps it doesn't. Perhaps different people in the literature mean a different word by the same word, you know, different things. Um, famous Humpty Dumpty questions of, you know, uh, whether you can do that. And the answer is, well, will you be the master or will the word be the master? Who cares in as much as we know that we're speaking about uh, different stuff? But on the other hand, uh, it seems to me that even if we accept that, we will still want to ask the question, which is probably a close variant of what Andrew is asking, so what's different about that? And how is that this thing that we're making a big song and dance about is not something new. What is more than something new? And a number of the things that I see, I might substitute the word actors, but I might substitute the words, you know, groups of firms with complementary assets or something that we may put the underlying economics of earlier on. And if this is the case, I'm just using a new label for a class of relationships and dynamics that we understand. The uh, scientists in me, not so in, in terms of how to manage ecosystems, related but separate from that, uh, the social scientists in me think that there should be something in terms of the causal links that must be uh, new. Uh, and this is what I will try to uh, look at. And my sense is that we cannot define a term on the basis of the outcome. Not say that there is collaboration, ergo, we have an ecosystem. Analytically, we need to define the structure, and then the structure may have a range of outcomes that we can consider. The ecosystem, to me, is more usefully defined as a structure. The structure must have some clear defining attributes if it is going to be useful, and then the ecosystem is going to be functional and dysfunctional. But otherwise, we're defining the whole field as whether it's a bunch of people who take it or well or not. Charlie. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Automotive industry, industry. We have kept, there's one more word use, and I should have said it at the beginning, I should have done this. There's one more way of using the word ecosystem, which is modern day parlance of clusters. Clusters didn't work out, especially in places like you and Oslo, not more than one. Uh, and I don't think we refer to a party that I can ask after, but the Congo is money, uh, but it's fine to use the extra collateral, 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 the extra collate
and I think the Google ecosystem allows provision to people who are disordered with the trust to buy the new settle when they buy. We have such ecosystem as class with prostitutes as separate from reality. And the same works is basically the theory they say about literature is not going to say in the region of elements, although the word is also used to be the reality people are thinking about it. So to a separate dimension, the proof of the thing isn't very different from uh, literature and this is the uh, that I was interested in deep in that in that way. So it seems like the self definition of the one that we used to earlier is if you want to decide where to center yourself as a hero, you know, you may choose the, the rich quote unquote ecosystem, like one thing that gets better than the next. Uh, but you're interested in that region because you want to develop it. I'm with you. I, I, the thing that we did do is we'll have some big dynamics, which let me perhaps a bit more closely there because, again, I don't want to say, explain what the literature says when I myself am critical of the way that the best sector happens to stop hearing my throat and I should move uh, straight on. But the open questions that I see are what's in and what's out of an ecosystem? Is it the whole capitalist system? Go back to uh, what you said a moment ago. Um, Andrew, I, you know, and we can't have a definition that focus on call a petition or mutual uh, forbearance. Um, and I think that we need to link with existing literature in a slightly more serious way. Uh, so let me give you perhaps the more, re the more uh, uh, both recent um, and uh, sort of finesse definition that is provided, which is a definition in terms of what and defines what I would say is the firm-centered or ego-centered view of everything. Ron Adler has done interesting work in trying to think about uh, the ways in which products that have that involve multiple players and uh, multiple parts of production process require alignment. Uh, and, and he pushes uh, quite a lot uh, with that. You can inspire, I guess, pretty much every academy of management on uh, some of these ecosystem issues. Uh, says that the ecosystem is defined by the alignment structure of the multilateral set of partners that need to interact in order for a total valuable position to materialize. And then he looks at what is the grammar of this ecosystem that says, oh, you can map them out, here are the roles, and so on. I would say that this is a useful definition if you want to think about the what, if you want to think about it from the perspective of the term. Um, on the other hand, it doesn't help me at least understand either why ecosystems emerge or what makes them more distinct from other types of alignments of uh, uh, players. So let me now go a step back and move into positive territory. This is used to covering what the literature and then the way we have thought about that collectively. So thinking about this, um, methodological uh, uh, foundations and frameworks. Uh, two things. I think that the ecosystem should describe the structure that separates the incentive alignment and cooperation that is the resulting behavior. I think that analytically, it, I, I don't find it consistent to define something on the basis of the output. I can see why there may be particular structures that we would be able to identify the chances. And then obviously, that gives us a bound, and this bound will tell us whether it's more or less likely to have cooperation. Sometimes it will happen, sometimes it will uh, not. The second thing is that the theory of ecosystems should also explain why ecosystems have emerged recently compared to other modes of organizing economic activity. This comparative and technical analysis that I was mentioning to say, well, when and what of it are there any underlying forces that we can map onto to understand their emergence and evolution? There are two basic uh, arguments in the view that I will uh, propose. I want to call it theory, want to call it theoretical foundations, and that is to articulate the importance, A, of modularity, and B, of different types of complementarity. And I will explain. Uh, and the third thing that, we, that I will look at is at the complementarity that creates the basis for the economic relationships that we observe in uh, the uh, ecosystem in terms of so the first thing, if you think about ecosystems, and if we start by trying to consider what would be a, uh, the, the stuff that we have on the backside of our mind, is that we have an interesting set of interactions, which may be a little bit more recent and may be more 
uh, particular, whereby there is a different link between uh, coordination and autonomy. Think about the two modal extremes. On the one hand, you have the traditionally not only vertically integrated firms, but also you have uh, the traditional uh, supply chains, whereby you may have a lot of interdependent actors, but you have clear authority and fiat, and there is a mandated nature and structure of what we supply and at what prices. And at the other, on the other hand, you have people who engage, to go back to capitalism, for example, in uh, uh, exchanges that are bring together things that could be complementary. Consider the triplets, tea, water, uh, tea bags. Are they complementary? Yes. Do they provide more value when they put them together? Yes. Are they an emphasis in any meaningful way? No. I mean, there are people having values, but there is nothing that links these in an interesting way. Whereas what I think that we are seeing in terms of a number of settings, and to go back to very familiar settings, consider what is happening in the, in the world of mobile telephony, and we consider what's doing with the phone, where you have uh, different types of choices that you're making in terms of whether you're buying an app or not. You are making the decision of whether you are going to be buying an app. It isn't a decision that is made centrally by the app. Uh, a provider of the platform uh, that is setting it, and there is autonomy in the way that these decisions are made. I think, though, that these are facilitated, these are enabled, there is a necessary condition which is multilateral, i.e., you need to have things that are clearly separable uh, items, clear separable bits that allow you to interchange them to lead to what most of us think about ecosystems when we think about what the is. So the first thing is modularity. Why is this important? I will claim that the significant increase in modularity in terms of the number of uh, areas, not only logical but also surface areas, has facilitated the emergence of a new way in which you're going to be putting things together, which has a different balance between authority and hierarchy. So I suggest that modularity allows for the alignment to occur without a lack of explicit coordination, but by a central agent. Without a lack thing. of... Do you say without a lack of... With, with, sorry, without coordination, yeah. with a lack of explicit coordination, without the existence, okay. without the existence of a central coordinating agent. Mm -hmm. And this is what makes, it, uh, the, what makes it an ecosystem, that you have things that are tied together, mm -hmm. but that are not centrally directed. Mm -hmm. And I think that modularity is what essentially gives, gives rise as a necessary condition. I cannot pick off many ecosystems which are not modular. And the reason that you cannot think about them is that evolutionarily it would come soon into trouble. Because if you don't have any central coordinating authority, you would have some interdependencies. These interdependencies need to be resolved. Good luck resolving them. If there is a degree of modularity between if you have some parameters that allow people to do their own stuff that are in a connected way, but do not require someone to do them. So in theory it could exist, but because of the evolutionary properties of the system that could emerge, you're not going to see it. So modularity matters, and it is a necessary condition. The second thing that I would say is that the ecosystem provides a, a solution to a distinct inter-firm coordination problem, and then we need to think about the coordination problem. So there needs to be a coordination, because you could say that even with modularity, you can think about it as different parts of the value chain. You know, my own work in terms of my value migration in the computer segment or non-value migration that in the automobile segment that, that, that you know, recent SMJ and all science say, well, we will look at the need that are more or less modular. It's not the nature of interdependency. And I would like to focus on not the interdependencies themselves, but what gives rise to interdependency. What can give rise to interdependency or what are the types of interdependencies that I think are, are relevant. There's two types of complementarity that can exist. So let's go all the way back to uh, economics and then think about essentially the first, which is the unique or strict complementarity, which is A does not function without B, or a type of A does not function without a type of B, or the model determines an A that is not uh, made work as B goes down, and this is at the core of Property theory and thirdly is the foundational idea of the nice transaction of economics, which was the act of post localization and the act of specificity that essentially means that really it works with B, otherwise you can have no 
not a working procedure, such as the output is low. This is dominant in the production because when you need things that need to coexist, then sort of sum usually takes proportion. So the two elements are unproductive and let the use together, which makes coordination and the investment in the two elements critical to maximize the marginal return on the investment. The second thing is the supermodular or Edgeworth uh, complementarity. That's all the fun stuff that the analytics of you know people like Dawkins uh, sort of points out, and that is at the foundation of network strategy, which is that the value of A goes up in the presence of B, and that underpins a lot of the analytics have to do uh, with um, externalities themselves. And I think that it is important to distinguish between them because quite often when we speak about mechanism or when we speak about platform mechanism, we may be making out some things that have unique and to the module uh, um, uh, complementarities that have very different underlying uh, economics results, right? So in production, um, the coordinated investments in X and Y yield higher returns or lower costs than the R coordinating uh, equivalents, and in consumption, this is the basis of the direct or indirect net effects, depending on how you're going to be sort of specifying that. Peter, I think it's a distinction you're making between those two. In the first one, it's all or nothing. In the second one, um, it's, no, it's no, not all one, or nothing? No, it's not. But the one is fixed proportion, the other is not. So the one you need A to B is some proportion. Mm -hmm. In the other one, the existence of a greater demand something Increases the marginal value of something else, right? So, so if you is A kind of just a, a, a corner solution of B, no, a, it's not a corner solution. Well, it's just an extreme because case one, one, well, you can think about it as 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 one that has some elasticity. The other is a, is Leon yet in production, right? right? Because you need it in fixed proportion, right? You know, you need uh, you know, an input to a car for a car, right? You know, a greater availability or greater demand for these cars right. does not do anything more than increase. Saying if you're a firm, I mean, already go into situation. If I'm a firm and I'm uh, locked into and I'm invested into an ecosystem that has only complementarities, I really care about how my ecosystem works because my demand will grow as my demand will grow. Uh, either my margins will increase because of volume or because of price. On the other hand, if there is super modularity, if there is a growth, there is a growth because there is a greater utility which gives me a super boosting in terms of the attractiveness because it, it'll increase the willingness to pay for any unit of the product that mm -hmm. I have. So the economics of these two are not the same. Sometimes you have a combination of the two, i.e. that there is both a customer... So if you took the super modular function and you turned it so that an additional amount of B, you know, if you lo lower the effect so that you got to zero, that you that then it would be in the first case, right? You, you could you could kind of continuously reduce how much benefit you get. So suppose you had a fixed amount of A. Yes. And then if you add more B, you get a little bit of benefit, but not not as much. That would be the second case. Well, but if you got no benefit whatsoever, that would be the first case. Is that, is that I can see a uh, I can see the sort of the degenerate function whereby beyond a level of A. There's no more marginal benefit. That right. That's essentially, the case, you can see, you can think in that case that case A is a highly special case right. of case B, which is a bounded case, which means that beyond one unit you don't have it. But in terms of the okay. intuition, so mathematically, yes, I can derive A from B. But okay. the intuition of it is that in one case there is a benefit from the ecosystem that goes over and above the demand that I face. So if I think about my investment in an ecosystem, if there is a co-specialization, I'm like, if that works, not only will I have more demand, but I'm going to have a higher price as a result of the fact that there is a greater utility from the stuff that I am selling. This is the distinction. So I you know, don't want to, in the analytics, there is a way of deriving one or the other, but my main uh, emphasis there is simply I just want to make sure I understand the distinction. Yeah, 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 yeah. I got it. Yeah, which is, which is essentially, it's, the economics of how much vested I am in case A and case B. Case B, I'm obviously more vested, if you want to think about it analytically, because I lose all right. the area from the tapering right. until infinity, even if it, there is a reducing marginal uh, impact from that. So yeah, I could present it this way, but I think that most people understand it when it's uh, provided as dichotomous, plus it maps onto slightly different literatures that have emerged, and you can say 
you know, how does that connect to previous uh, literatures? Um, now, the second, um, the second thing that uh, um, I'm, uh, I'd like to say here is that uh, the, the role of complementarity is a part of ecosystems. Uh, um, and I would like to introduce one more important distinction. And this will be the definitional feature that will address uh, head on Andrew's early question in terms of complementarity for things that exist in general. And I did speak about the order. So here's the twist. And you can think about the generic and specific and the role of fungibility. There are some, uh, uh, some of these complementarities that are, um, that tend uh, to be, uh, uh, tends to be uh, generic, i.e. they are interchangeable between uh, particular groups of actors that tend to uh, coexist, whereas others, they are specific. So uh, what I think is interesting here, and I'll go into the, uh, uh, the nature of what I think an ecosystem has, is that the ecosystems provide uh, the non-generic complementarities because if you have a non-generic complementarity, so if you have something which is tied to a given group of other actors, then your fate becomes in the spine, not because you have any altruistic uh, benefits, or not because you care about the fact that increasing some factor of production will affect your potential response, but because you have made a commitment to a given community, a given group of them, which is actively not the example, if you want to think about the economics that relate to the state platforms, and you want to think about the Android uh, versus Apple, if I have an investment which is specific to having something written for Android and specific to written for Apple, all of a sudden these interdependencies create to me an interest into what this collective is going to do. Now let me turn the dial of the fungibility all the way down. And let me take this is generic. And I have a little Greek translator that takes something that has been written for the Apple ecosystem that says I will take it and with no cost, it will also work for Android. How better am I in the context of Apple? The answer is not at all. Because it has ceased being specific and it is now generic. I think that what is interesting about ecosystems and what is interesting, uh, interesting about the form that we're seeing is that we see an increase of these groups of firms that are creating something which is at least partly fungible, i.e. specific to groups of firms that so specialize that they cannot take elsewhere. Now let me go full circle to what you're asking. The question that I have when I think about uh, the important in terms of their, how much people can really care about it with a complicated of their investment. And it used to be that the problem is this, that you go somewhere and you incur some non-fungible cost of you know, your location and your investment in your area and so on and so forth. But in the broader scheme of things, the question of responsibility in terms of what firms can do within an area if they have a common purpose, development or whatever else, will affect the extent to which they will be cooperative and supportive of each other and what I'm trying to do, go back to your question about platforms, uh, Andrew, what I'm trying to do is to say, it may not be a platform, and you may agree that a number of them are a platform. What I want to look at is whether I can find a couple of things that will help me understand what are the differential dynamics within the ecosystems that are nested on platforms. So, for instance, if something is more or less fungible, if it is not fungible at all, let me go uh, back to that, and I think that I've, uh, I've, I've mentioned that. You can think about uh, things that have unique complementarity, that have supermodular complementarity, or have both. I would say that there is a big class of things that here are generic. They've got generic, uh, complement generic uh, complementarities, both on the supermodular side and on the unique side. Or perhaps they don't have any complementarities in which case they are not interesting to think of as ecosystems. So when I hear about something which is an ecosystem, if it's Airbnb or something, you're like, oh, if something is entirely pushable between Airbnb and any other platform, then the behavior of me as someone that is potentially interested or will get my business there versus somewhere else is going to be pretty low. It will affect the behavior both of me and of the nature of the ecosystem. The fact that it's a platform or not, 
the extent to which we have supermodular complementarity creates an extra boost, an extra kick when it exists in terms of my own incentives, because it isn't only that I'm going to get more demand, but people will get more utility. So while I agree that we can perhaps put it in one very sophisticated angle, I think that it's a potentially useful way of sorting out where we see more of this versus uh, not. So let me move to what is my proposal in terms of the mission. Yes. So maybe the question So take two wheels, you know, very common examples of something you would build your operating system application mm -hmm. put together with something. Why do I need to think about why do we need the system? Why don't I I'm interested in market software? It, why don't I just look at that market and do it producer and do it you know, what's the nature of demand? Why do I need to forge the system at all? You will only get to it if there are groups of non generic
sometimes uh, people try to design ecosystems that don't make sense. And we have a fun uh, example of the automobile sector, which is Paul McDuffie and my PhD student Jennifer Clay, uh, where we see at how the sector leads into a more modular structure, which as Charlie will know, uh, was a deep blunder, not only the operational side, but also strategically, and they were lucky at the night the end because they were able to stand up and sort of reverse uh, code. Um, modularity does not necessarily mean openness, uh, but um, what I think is particularly interesting is that both regulators and customers they want to push for open standards, and here we go back to some of the implications of why do I care about that, because to the extent that these create extreme value for creation dynamics, there may be a reason for us to move these interdependencies to more standard interfaces, which would not make sense for the individual firm, but would make sense for more of the actors there. Uh, and that raises the issue, which is really interesting in terms of the governance and rules and, uh, in terms of ecosystems. Now, in terms of uh, collaboration, as I mentioned, the nature of complementarities is important, and the reason is that the amount of benefit as well as of potential value appropriation that exists is a function of the nature of complementarities um, and fungibility becomes a, a, a key issue. Let's go to design issues. If you think about fungibility, now you're sitting thinking, will I try to ask people to do something very specific to me or will it be generic, which is an interesting strategic choice when you're designing your ecosystem or a policy choice when you're thinking about the policy makers and whether they are able to sustain that. The more fungible you create things, the more likely that people will uh, potentially join an ecosystem because they will not be locked in, but the less uh, able you are to expropriate at the center of the ecosystem value. The less fungible it, it is, the more you are able to have people that are better in your own sector. And there are some further interactions there. So for instance, if you are in a sector where you have a huge amount of power, you have brand visibility, you have network externalities, then what you're going to say is, look, I don't need to make that fungible because people will have to, whether they like it or, or not, to go in where I am, or my fungibility will need to go down as my success goes up so that people become even more locked into my system than the other way around. And again, the effort here is to understand the dynamics of governance and rules in ecosystem, both as a strategic and as a welfare system. And um, also, in addition uh, to uh, understanding the type of complementarities, the directionality is also matters. Um, what is fungible is not symmetric, and the relative fungibility of one side onto the other, I think, is interesting to think about uh, how, uh, how that affects uh, the potential value distribution dynamics. So now we move into the tactics of building um, uh, super modular ecosystems that may be different to the ones that uh, only have um, complementarity. And you could create toy models of showing how, how the dynamics early versus late on are going to be different when you have super modular effects, uh, as opposed, and you're willing to bleed early on, but when the super modular effects are not there, you should not uh, be interested uh, to do that. Um, and uh, that takes us to the nature of a competitive uh, context. Now, given uh, the interest of time, let me just try to give you a couple of different examples. Now, when people are speaking about ecosystems, and I took one of the sponsors in Eric's uh, conference, which is Ant Financial, I took that from Ant Financial's strategy presentation. Uh, you see the company in the center saying, it's us, and this is the ecosystem, which means everything around it. And what I'm suggesting is that this is a potentially useful metaphor to understand of the world. And you can say, hey, here I am. Uh, this is, these are the companies, and this is all the bets they're taking in these sort of new areas. Uh, but on the other hand, it does not really help you understand what are the value dynamics at the level of the sector and at the level of the ecosystem. The kind of stuff that I'm particularly interested to understand are things like this picture, which shows you the difference between uh, Bupaka, that uh, employs around half a million people, 
uh, and makes 5.4 billion euros profit. And uh, Booking.com that employs 8,000 people and makes 5.8 billion dollars of profit. And the reason is that it has managed to lock, uh, both create something with significant supermodular um, uh, complementarity and lock them in, interestingly, with much more stringent rules than you have in other book publishing agents as a result uh, of uh, where it goes. And you know that's sort of sort of more examples that I don't have the time to go into uh, in terms of why the dynamics in the automobile sector and the computer sector uh, are very different. And the reason is that the underlying structure in these different sectors is different, leading to uh, uh, some that have a strong sort of ecosystem um, sense or not. So in a couple of weeks in London, we've got this uh, workshop on ecosystems in mobility. Well, we'll have you know one of the participants in this uh, room join us, uh, where part of the story is to understand what is the nature of the ecosystems that are going to be created. It is implicit in some of the variations that we see that the speed of variation are exhibitions in terms of not only the relative value of uh, some firms like uh, Uber in particular, despite its its massive trouble. Uh, the uh, uh, shooting and uh, uh, increasingly lit, but also in terms of the implications for that has for the ability of some players to be at the core of ecosystems and manage all the other players as peripheral players. And the question is, is this plausible? Do we expect that to happen? What are the necessary assumptions for these valuations to be true? Can we start debunking them if we try to map out what the expected ecosystem structures may actually be? Because I think that there's a number of these sort of embedded uh, assumptions uh, that exist there. I think that the, the, the challenge as I see it is that um, as we move into new applications, we have uh, products and services that are the composites of a number of individual pieces. Think about smartphones, think about uh, autonomous cars, and what that means is that you will have the possibility of more efforts and more bets of connecting more modular pieces in potentially uh, connected uh, uh, ecosystems with particular types of complementarity. So I think that we need to understand both the nature of these ecosystems and uh, the structure uh, that we get. Yes. I would have thought the vocabulary would be that Uber is part, Uber and their drivers and their customers are part of a platform that is part of the automotive ecosystem. The automotive ecosystem is bigger than Uber and their drivers and cars. So I, would, I wouldn't have thought you'd say that Uber is an ecosystem. No, no, no. no. I, I, the in the ecosystem, if I said that, I'd have to go too far. But, the word ecosystem, I mean, people need to abandon at some stage because I think that what you see is that there are some groups of players, of actors, that tend to be connected to non generic uh, uh, complementarities, sometimes super modular, which is why I drive trade generations, sometimes not the modular of the people who are concerned with different things, and very high valuations imply the ability of each of these positions to expand. So, for instance, Uber, I'm you know, working with a head of uh, um, research for Uber Evans. Now, what their bet is, is that they will expand and they will create some kind of complementarities that will not only have supermodularity in terms of making that more and more valuable as they grow more and more, but that there's going to be specific enough to make them the center because people will be all vested to working with them as opposed to say this is going to become an industry standard and as a result if it becomes an industry standard the value of Uber should collapse to a few hundred million at most and do a useful thing but they will not do something that will allow them to have all this power so what I'm trying to get at is what are the economic connections or relationships in terms of 
you know, the nature of the complementarities and the fungibility of the investments that allow you at the center of the ecosystem to wield this, uh, this big power. In automobiles, I think there's a lot of confusion. We'll see that in our, uh, in our seminar in a couple of weeks, where people say, well, who's going to be you know, commoditized or not? If it's commoditized, these things are entirely generic and you're not affected by linking something under the roof. And I think the strategy you know, uh, is now becoming much more about positioning in a way that we can create people who are also have a better interest in your success. So how do you do that strategy? So that's kind of the, the things that I want to cover. But I know that time is running uh, out and we'll also get into the stuff which things in London. So let me try to uh, say what I think are the implications. I think that there's a number of things that that suggests in terms of what we want to look at. First, consider the emergence, demise, and mutation of ecosystems as an empirical project in and of itself. Look at the context which enables the emergence of failure of ecosystems versus things that have industry standards in between them, because not all sectors have ecosystems. Second, document the governance and rules in ecosystems. There's fantastically interesting stuff that we don't have explicit studies on. There are ecosystems that are very, very uh, top-down heavy, and there is very clear specs that, and hurdles that you need to uh, create. There's others which are much more flexible. What is the impact? When do we see each kind of choice? What are the performance implications of different types of choices in terms of the way that you govern them? Because again, the, the sets of rules of participation for the ecosystem to me uh, becomes an empirical project in and of itself. But the spatial rules, exclusivity, the role of hierarchy, what is the remit of the hub in the ecosystem uh, or the function in the platform if you want to look at it in the platform. Understand the fungibility of investment and its impact. Um, and then consider the role of ecosystems on society and uh, welfare um, in general. Um, I think that we need to take the, uh, the hub or uh, keystone uh, seriously uh, because much of the uh, much of the strategic advice that I see out there is people telling firms become like Google or become like Facebook, which I think is first of all statistically not terribly relevant because very few firms can credibly become hubs. They need to participate in areas where the ecosystems are formed. And so the canonical question is, how do you respond when there is a strong ecosystem? Do you want to encourage multi-homing so that your segment is not marginalized? Very interesting open question for people in the telco sector that are finding themselves increasingly marginalized and who allowed Android to become quite as important as it did uh, in uh, the past. So how should hubs balance uh, their desire to appropriate uh, with the need to attract uh, others? And also, and perhaps more importantly, take the small guys and the multiple ecosystems into account. Much of the sort of top business advice is be at the center, have everyone around you, which is not the can. Uh, there are many more millions of complementaries to existing hubs. And I think that although we start, we have now started platform area in particular, we do some good work in terms of multi roaming. I think there are there's more uh, uh, to, to look at in terms of the uh, 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 competitive context. Um, and finally, think about the process requirements that allow firms to be successful in ecosystems. There's terrific choices of success, but also failure. And things that if you look at network instrumentalities alone, you would not be able to understand. So if you look at Symbian, with about 62% of the market share, you would never have expected on the basis of network externalities alone that it would have grown to zero and Android would have grown up. So only looking at the traditional network externality does not have the answer. I think that the key to the difference between Symbian and Android was a different ecosystem design and the ability of Google to attract many more players as opposed to Nokia's stupid insistence of managing it as an autocracy that really cost the success of that. So do we see an impact that could be industry defining? I think we do. And I think that it really has to do with the way that you manage these ecosystems. Um, and if we start looking at them, you're going to also see some interesting, this is a picture from um, a Oliver Wyman, a study that was done uh, about three and a half years ago, 
it'll look re really more interesting now if you think about not only ecosystems, but the meta ecosystem choice of the big firms, i.e. one firm participates in a number of different ecosystems, and at the core of it is the desire to have a link to the final customer. So we have to think not only the ecosystems, which is at the level of one set of customer needs at a time, but also the needs that span a number of different uh, ecosystems. I think that I'm out of time. Uh, there's a few more things, but thank you very much for your patience. And mostly, I look forward to learning from you uh, by your thoughts, reactions, and feedback. I'm going to be here, but my email is also available. I'd love to interact more. Eric, thank you for the invitation. Well, thank you very much, Michael. Appreciate that. I'm sorry we ran out of time there. Um, so I just want to let everyone know that uh, in two weeks, we have uh, Gary Marcus. He's going to be talking about what AI can and cannot do. Uh, it should be a very interesting talk. All right. Well, thank you. Yes. Thanks.